and thanks very much for the invitation to speak here. So uh, the topic of this lecture is complex Brun Minkowski theory. That's a term that I have invented myself. So if you don't know it, that's easily explained. Uh, and I'm going to explain what it is. And actually, I'm going to give two lectures, so one now and one on Friday. And now the thing now, the lecture today will be basically about uh, uh, stating some theorems. And then in the next lecture, I will try to show applications of those theorems to geometrical problems. So what is complex Brun Minkowski theory? I think I'll move over here. Uh, well, they are theorems about the curvature of certain holomorphic vector bundles. And uh, I will argue that those theorems are formally analogous to the classical theorems of Brun Minkowski and also Prekopa that I will describe soon first. And uh, they also imply those theorems. So they are sort of, in a sense, they are stronger than the theorem from convex geometry, but they are in a complex setting, and they are really from complex analysis. And they have applications, I claim. If you hang around for the next lecture, you will see some of them. You will also see a little bit of it today, maybe. But they have applications in complex analysis, in algebraic geometry, and in Kähler geometry. So what are they? In order to explain that, I will start to give a review uh, of uh, the classical Brun-Minkowski inequality. So, that, so the real Brun-Minkowski, the first formulation of the theorem is the following. Say that I have two convex bodies. Oh, they're called A0 and A1 here. I should change here then. This is A0, and this one is A1. There are two different convex bodies. And then you look at the Minkowski sum of those two things. That's the following thing. So you just take A0 plus A1. That's the set of all little a zeros plus a little A1, such that uh, the first one lies in capital A0 and the second one lies in capital A1. That's called the Minkowski sum of those. And they are, they are convex bodies in Rn. So i drawn them over here. So here is like A0. And here is A1 that I think of here as a ball, but it could be any convex body. And then when I add A1 to A0, I will get something A0 union, all these little balls around here. And so I will get something slightly, in this case, slightly larger than A1. And the question is, how much larger? Well, uh, uh, that's uh, exactly the content of the theorem, the Brun Minkowski theorem. It was first given by Brun in, in two dimensions, I think, and then the general version by Minkowski in 1896. And it says that you have a sort of triangle inequality for those things, but it goes the wrong way. So, cap is, so, so the volume of the Minkowski sum raised to the power one over the dimension is greater than this sum of those things. So they satisfy a sort of reverse triangle inequality. And you can formulate it a little bit more generally, uh, like this, that if you take convex combination of them, in the same way as you form the sum there, you, get a, you take the volume of the result and you will get a concave function, concave function. So it says that the Minkowski sum is pretty big, uh, the volume of it is pretty big, and in this case here, when one of them is the ball, it sort of says then when you do this, when you take A0 plus A1, if this is a ball with radius epsilon, the sum here will be like all the points whose distance to A0 is smaller than epsilon. And you get an estimate for that. And that's related, and then the inequality is related to the surface area of the boundary of this thing. Right. So it implies the isoperimetric inequality, for instance, for convex bodies, but it is much stronger than that. OK. And now you can also state it in a different way here. So what's this different way? Uh, there is an equivalent formulation. It looks like this. Instead of taking convex bodies uh, and taking the sum, we, we look at one convex body in higher dimension. So this is supposed, as I draw it here, this is going to be, this you can think of as R. And this you think of as Rn. Uh, and then you look at the slices of those things. So you take a point here, T, here in R. And you look at the slice above that. So that's a subset, a convex subset of uh, Rn. 
And the conclusion is the same, that the volume of this slice here is, uh, is a concave function. You take it, raise it to the power 1 over n. So this is actually, you can go from one to the other fairly easily. So they are equivalent in this mathematical sloppy way of defining things. They are equivalent. It's easy to prove one from the other. But I prefer this formulation, as you will see soon. And you can even make it a little bit weaker, which I will do, by saying that this implies that the logarithm of the volume is concave. That's an immediate consequence, but as a matter of fact, it's also equivalent, this thing here. Uh, because you, you, can, you can prove it with uh, the stronger version with the power here from the log version by using the homogeneity of Lebesgue measures. But when we're soon going to look at other forms of uh, uh, measures that are not Lebesgue measure, then uh, it's really a difference, and then the log version is better. Sometimes this is called the multiplicative version of the Minkowski theorem. Okay, so they are equivalent. Now, uh, they are philosophically different, I will argue, because say that you want to generalize the theorem like I wanted to do. Uh, then if you look at the first formulation, you would look for a situation where you have a notion of addition or something like that. You have some sort of group structure. You could look, instead of, instead of looking at points in R, and you could look at lattice points or more general groups or something like that, and you could try to prove Grun-Minkowski theorems in that setting. So that uh, has been done. I don't know so much about it, but that's one line of research of generalizations of Brun-Minkowski. But if you look at the other formulation, you don't need any addition. There is no addition mentioned. You just start with something which is convex, and then you look at the slices of that convex thing and look at how the volume of those. So all you need to know in that case is the notion of convexity. So that's what I will look at. And in, the, in our case here, in the complex setting, I will change the usual notion of convexity, which is real convexity. I change it to notions in complex analysis, which is known as pseudo-convexity, or maybe the Kähler condition in case of manifolds. So that's uh, how we will do it. That's the philosophical side of it. But first, I will state a, the function version of uh, the Minkowski theorem, which is the following. It's called Prekopas theorem. So what is Prekopas theorem? Well, then you don't start with a convex body in uh, Rn like I had here, but you start with a convex function. So I write it like this. It depends on t and x. So now it's a function Rn plus 1 on this big set there. And then instead of looking at the volumes, I look at uh, integrals. So here I look at the integrals. Uh, I fix the t variable, and I integrate with respect to x. And then I define a new function, phi tilde, like that, minus the logarithm of those fiber integrals, slice integrals. And the conclusion, you can also write it like this, which is somehow more suggestive in a little second. And the conclusion is then that phi tilde is convex. That's a convex function. That's called Prekopas theorem. And... Uh, I should know, but I don't really know. But Prekopa was an applied mathematician. So this is, is something that comes from, uh, maybe you know, uh, Jan, you, 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 but it's, it, it, I have in the back of my head something about water tanks and the flow of water and God knows what. But I, I mean, from a mathematics point of view, it's uh, certainly a natural sort of question. You start with convex body, you can ask, do you have something similar for convex functions? But I don't know. Uh, but I do know that, uh, well, first, uh, it's stated also. I mean, it, it's uh, interesting, of course, in probability theory. It's, it says that a, a measure that looks like this, a uh, Lebesgue measure multiplied by e to the minus phi, where phi is convex, that's called a log concave measure. And uh, this. Uh, I take the fiber integral of, of, of such things here. That's called the marginal distribution of this measure. And so the jargon is that the, the marginals of log concave things are still log concave. So, so it uh, certainly makes sense in, in, uh, uh, yeah, in that formulation. And it does imply the Brun-Minkowski theorem 
because you apply this theorem here to the function phi. In the Bluminkowski case, you have a convex body. You define a function, which is zero in here, infinity outside. So it's zero in here and infinity out here. And then you look at those integrals. Then you have e to the minus zero, so you get one. You integrate, uh, you, 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 those integrals will just be the volume of the slices. Nothing outside because you get e to the minus infinity. And so the conclusion is precisely the same then. So it's a stronger version than from Minkowski. Okay. So, so one important thing to say, because first when you just look at the theorem, you say that this must be a, uh, a consequence of, well, if you don't know the business, if you've never seen it before, you would say that this should follow from Helder's inequality. You just apply the convexity with respect to T or something like that. But no, that's not the case. If you try to prove it with Helder's inequality, you will get a similar inequality that goes in some sense in the opposite direction. So if you, if you do Helder, you could prove the same thing when you take away the minus sign there and the minus sign there. So that's a simple theorem. But uh, the point with this theorem is that you have the minus signs. And uh, let me see. And uh, for this, you really need to know that phi is convex with respect to all of the variables. So that's important, not just the t variable. And I'm going to sketch one proof of this because I think it has a lot to do with what I'm going to say in the complex version after. And this is via the so-called Braskamp-Lieb inequality. So that was a proof that was discovered by Braskamp and Lieb in the 1970s. Also, I'm going to write it down now. And I'm going to I write it down in one real variable, which is really the main case. It's a simplification, but if you know it in one variable, then you actually know it in any number of variables. So this is not a big restriction. And so you start with a convex function, no t now. It's just a convex function on R. And you, you look at, so to speak, the, the L2 space of uh, functions u such that are square integrable with respect to this weighted measure. And you take one such function, and you assume that its mean value is equal to 0. Integral of u is equal to 0 against this measure. Then you have this inequality. You can estimate the u squared, uh, the L2 norm of u with respect to this measure by the L2 norm, some L2 norm of the derivative of u. That's the Braskamp-Lieb inequality. And I think it is like uh, something like 1972 or 83 or something like that. Uh, let me see. Do I? So it's a Poincaré inequality. Uh, Poincaré inequality means that you estimate the function with its derivative. And then you need some sort of condition so that you rule out the constant. And that is this condition here in this case. And it is also, the key word here is that it is actually a version of Hermander's L2 estimate for the d-bar equation. But not, now it's not the equation uh, d-bar u equal to f. Now it's the equation u prime of x equal to f on the real line. So if you think of, the, you want to study this differential equation, which is probably the simplest differential equation in the world, and you decide to use all these L2 techniques, et cetera, to study this, then you might uh, arrive at the, at the theorem here, the brass can't believe in equality. I think this is sort of interesting and, uh, and, and nice in a way, that you can really do something, you can find something simple. You can find something interesting about real simple things. I mean, so this says that the equation, the, um, this is the real variable version of Hermann's theorem. You can solve the equation u prime x equal to f with such an estimate here. So you put an f there instead of u prime. So that's. Uh... OK, uh, once you have this, uh, now we, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to sketch the proof of Prekopa from Braskem Lee then. So you want to prove that this function phi tilde that I defined, that it is convex. And so the natural way to try to do it is just to compute the second derivative of phi tilde. And after some computation, you arrive at this formula. Phi dot means the derivative with respect to t of phi. And phi double dot is the second derivative with respect to t. And phi dot with a hat is, the, is a constant. It's the average of phi dot with respect to the measure. And then you get this. You want to prove that this is positive. Now, this function here 
phi dot minus the average of phi dot is a perfectly legitimate u. It has uh, integral zero now. So it, it qualifies as a u in the brassian lieb inequality. We can choose u in the brassian lieb inequality as this. And then we find, so we replace this now from the brassian lieb we replace it by something bigger, and we get uh, phi dot, and the prime means the derivative with respect to x. And then uh, just plug it in there. And now this integrand here that you integrate is essentially the determinant of the Hessian of, of phi. Determinant of the Hessian. If you put them on a common denominator, you get second derivative with respect to t multiplied by second derivative with respect to x, and then minus the mixed derivative squared, so it's a determinant. And since the function is convex with respect to all of the variables, the Hessian is, is, is positively definite, so the determinant is certainly positive. And uh, therefore, you get that uh, the phi tilde, the function phi tilde, the second derivative is positive, so it's convex. So that's it. So that's a neat proof uh, once you have proved the Braskam Lieb inequality. And Braskam Lieb inequality really was discovered after the Hermander L2 estimate for d bar. That's another interesting thing. Maybe I'm discussing too much, but if you look at if you are if you're a complex analyst, you're interested in Hermandus L2 estimate for d bar. It's a very important theorem in that business. And it's a theorem that had, has had a sort of a strange career because it, it's, gone, it's been generalized from the most difficult situation to simpler and simpler situation. It's the opposite of the, of the usual road. The first avatar of Hermandus L2 estimate was the Codera vanishing theorem, which is about compact manifolds, etc. Then you got to domains in in CN, and then you got to finally the real case here in Braskem Lieb. So uh, sort of the opposite direction. OK, now we go to the complex case. So uh, we saw that uh, Prekopa and Brominkowski follow on Braskem Lieb's inequality. Uh, and, and that's the real version of Hermander. So you can ask then uh, what theorems you would get in the complex setting by uh, using Hermander instead of Braskem Lieb. Then that uh, seems to be a reasonable question. It's not exactly how I started, but in retrospect, uh, this is the most natural way of thinking of things. I think. Okay, uh, so we just say hi here for those who, are, who don't work with complex analysis in general. I'm going to talk about plurisubharmonic functions, and uh, they are subharmonic. They are functions in C N now that are subharmonic on each complex line. So here is Cn. If I have a function so such that when I take the restriction to any line in Cn, it's subharmonic on, on the real line, then it's called plurisubharmonic. And uh, that's the same thing as saying that uh, the Hessian is, uh, this complex Hessian is positively semi-definite looks very much like the condition for convexity in real analysis. You can also say that it means that this uh, differential form is positive. And the definition of positivity of forms is such that it means precisely this. That is the thing there. So i d d bar of i is a positive form. Uh, and then we need a counterpart of convex bodies. And they are the pseudo-convex domains, in case you're looking at domains in CN. If in case you're looking at manifolds, they are maybe Stein manifolds. And such manifolds, uh, uh, such domains, they are defined by the condition that there exists a plurisubharmonic exhaustion function. So there should exist a plurisubharmonic function inside of here, if it's pseudo-convex, that goes to infinity when you approach the boundary, goes to plus infinity when you approach the boundary. Yeah, so that's uh, the, the, the counterpart of convex sets of bodies. And finally, for compact manifolds, they can never be Stein or such a thing. But then we have the Kähler condition. They are Kähler manifolds. And that means that they have a Kähler metric. And that's a Hermitian metric, which locally can be given as the Hessian of a plurisubharmonic function. So the, uh, the fundamental form of the metric uh, something like this, should be i d d bar of phi locally, where phi is a plurisubharmonic function. Then it's a Kähler, strictly plurisubharmonic function. Then it's a Kähler manifold. So th that's a little bit surprising that this is a, a convexity assumption, but uh, that's a little bit the conclusion of some of the things I'm going to say. 
So now you can look at the naive generalization of Prekopa. You, you would take uh, a uh, plurisubharmonic function instead of convex function on Cn plus 1, and you uh, construct the same function phi tilde here, and you ask, is it plurisubharmonic in T, or subharmonic in this case, then, instead of convex? That would be the natural generalization. And uh, the answer is no, it is not always subharmonic, this thing. And there was a simple example by Chiselman, which is the following example here. You take uh, n equal to 1, yeah, n equal to 1, so, so, so c lies in c, this one lies in c, and this one also lies in c, and you look at this function here, uh, which doesn't look very plurisubharmonic, but it is, if, because you can rewrite it in this form, then this is plurisubharmonic because it's convex, and this is the real part of a holomorphic function, so it's also, it's even pluriharmonic. And then if you compute phi tilde, you use the first formula here, they integrate with respect to C, it's very easy to compute the integral because you just integrate the Gaussian, this one goes out and you find that phi tilde is equal to this, which is not then uh, subharmonic, it's rather the opposite, it's superharmonic. So this doesn't work. Yeah. So that seems like bad news then, but it turns out that we have to look at things in a different way then. So we have to change now, instead of looking at the volumes of sets, we look at, uh, we think of volumes as the L2 norms of something. The, the volume of a set is the L2 norm, squared L2 norm of uh, the function one. And those pre copa integral, uh, integrals, they are also weighted L2 norms of the function 1. Uh, and in the complex setting, we use L2 norms of holomorphic functions instead, instead of, uh, instead of constants. So that's uh, somehow how one gets a theorem that does hold instead of the naive generalization. So, so we're looking at such things. Uh, either L2 norms, just plain L2 norms over a domain, or weighted L2 norms over some domain of this. So that's the counterpart of the volume then. We have to plug in a holomorphic function, and, and which is sort of natural because it means that we are not only repla replacing convexity by subharmonicity, but we are replacing the kernel of D, D, which are the constant functions, by the kernel of d bar, which are the holomorphic functions. So it's really quite uh, similar and parallel, the whole thing. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to give the first version of uh, the complex Brun-Minkowski theorem, it's up there. And actually, I'm starting with the most complicated version. So this is the, well, most, well the least elementary, but it, it's really, in a way, still the simplest thing. So uh, we let beautiful x be a complex manifold, fibered over a base b, which is also a complex manifold. So it's, I can just use the same uh, figure here. So this is now the manifold, the base here is b, and this is uh, another manifold x, beautiful x, and I have a map from beautiful x to the base, which is called p, and I take a point t here, and I get the fiber xt, which is equal to p inverse of t. That's the fiber there. So that looks pretty much like uh, this was a convex body, and uh, I took a linear projection, but now I take a holomorphic map like that. Uh, so let me see what I wrote here. Uh, so we have a surjective holomorphic map, uh, and uh, yeah, xt are the fibers of the map. And uh, before we had the convex body. So examples of this is, uh, actually, let's look at the second example first. The second example is a trivial vibration. Uh, so you take, yeah, so you take beautiful x is just the product of some fixed manifold and the, this one. So you take a fixed manifold here. This is x 
and you take the product with B, and you get some sort of cylinder like this. Beautiful. And you have B here on the projection map there. So that's the simplest case. Uh, otherwise, you, in the more general case here, you can think of this as a family of complex manifolds that are indexed by the T in the base here. And, and such things occur in algebraic geometry, for instance, when you have uh, algebraic manifolds that are defined by the, the, the polynomials that define them in the projective space. So that's a, a very common object of study. And I assume that P is smooth. So in this jargon, it means that uh, it's a submersion. First, we assume that it's not really necessary in the end. But to state the theorem in a nice way, we assume that it is smooth, which means that it's, it's certainly smooth because it's holomorphic. But it's smooth in the sense that uh, the differential is surjective in every point. Yes. And then the fibers will really be manifolds. And then we assume it's proper so that the fibers are compact. So we get a family now of, of, of compact manifolds, which may be a constant family. Still interesting case when it's a compact, a constant family like this. Uh, and then I assume the convexity assumption, which is that the total space here is scalar. Total space is scalar. And uh, now I want to have my e to the minus phi. And in the case of compact manifolds, it has to be, we have to involve a line bundle. So L is a holomorphic line bundle over beautiful X. And we have a positively curved m metric on the line bundle, which I write as e to the minus phi. So this means that locally, the metric is given as h e to the minus phi, where phi is plurisubharmonic function, just as before. I suppose here that there are some people that work with complex manifolds and some people that don't. And those that don't work with complex manifolds can just listen to this as, uh, on the intuitive way. And I get back to uh, domains and uh, non-line bundles a little bit later. And then we look at holomorphic sections instead of holomorphic functions over here. I look at holomorphic sections of the line bundle. And we look at their L2 norms. But how do you define the L2 norm of a section of a line bundle? I want to integrate. I have, I have a section of a line bundle. And I want to define integral over xt of u squared e to the minus phi. I, I would like to define that. And it seems that one would want a measure there to integrate against. But we have no such measure available here, no God-given measure to put in there. So uh, how do we handle this? What do we put here as a measure? It will, it, it will be very important what one puts, unless one circumvents the whole problem, which is what I'm going to do. I circumvent it in the following way, that we look instead of holomorphic n forms. So we think of u as a holomorphic n form with value in L. So u is a n zero form, something that looks like U, locally, it looks like u is equal to uh, g times dc1 dcn, like this. And uh, then I can easily uh, define the L2 norm, because I just uh, say that the L2 norm is I take the wedge product of this form with itself. I get the volume form. And the e to the minus phi uh, guarantees that this is a global uh, expression. And then I have a constant here, which is there. It's plus, plus or minus 1. It is there to make the whole thing positive. Oops, uh, was that really? Yeah, that was it. OK, so now is the first uh, theorem then. So the first theorem is this, that if we have precisely this situation here, we have a smooth proper vibration. We have a, a, a Hermitian holomorphic line bundle over the total space, where the metric is smooth and uh, uh, pluris harmonic. So we have this. It, it means it, the curvature of the line bundle is positive. And you assume that the total space is scalar. And then we can find, we can look now at, the, instead of looking at just the uh, family of volumes here, I look at the family of uh, vector spaces, which are 
which is there, I write it as ET is H0 XT KXT plus L. So what does that mean? It means precisely that I take a fiber XT. I look at, uh, this means that I look at the holomorphic N forms with values in L over the fiber. That's what it means. And then I have the L2 norms for each fiber. And then the conclusion is that this is actually a, hol hol a holomorphic vector bundle when this moves here. And it has a metric, which I have there. And the conclusion is that this metric has a curvature which is positive. The curvature of the metric is positive. And uh, then there is some addendum here that uh, in complex uh, geometry, there are different notions of curvature positivity. There's a stronger one, Nakano positivity. And even that is satisfied here, but it, I'm not going to insist on that. So that's the, uh, that's the theorem then. OK, so what does this have to do? Yeah. So if you forget the theorem, it's all the question. <laughs> but then you really need a magnifying glass. So. Uh, yes. So the Keller metric does not appear. Yeah. That's, a, that's sort of interesting also that the Keller metric make, makes no appearance here. It's actually the same thing if you look at Hermander's L2 estimate. If you want to do it on a complex manifold and you are dealing with uh, N1 forms, you have to assume the manifold is Keller, but uh, there is no Keller metric in the statement. So it's really, but you really have to assume it. Uh, so it's a little bit like Alice in Wonderland with this cat that uh, disappears and only the smile of the cat is left afterwards. So, so we need the, sm the smile of the, of the Keller metric is here somehow. So uh, I just want to say here that in the language of algebraic geometry, this vector bundle is called uh, it's the vector bundle that's associated to the direct image sheaf. So uh, it means, this means the direct image of this sheaf up there. And uh, so uh, that's just words that will not play any role here, but in case somebody is working in, uh, with such things. This is, says that the direct image bundle of a, of a twisted relative canonical bundle is positive. So I, uh, yeah, I, a relative canonical bundle is a bundle on the total space that restricts to the canonical bundle the bundle of n forms on each fiber. And you can define it like this, but it's not important here. I just want to say that Griffiths proved this theorem when L is trivial. So you don't have a twisted bundle, a twisted canonical bundle. You just look at the n forms themselves. And then Griffiths proved that this uh, it was a part of his theory on variation of Hodge structures that uh, this bundle is positive. And this was uh, emphasized by Fujita. And uh, Griffith's motivation was different. He wanted to generalize the notion of a period map from Riemann surfaces to higher dimensions. So he was interested in the n forms themselves. In, in the one-dimensional case of Riemann surfaces, you have one forms. Period maps are defined by integrating one forms over curves. So uh, uh, the, the topic of interest for Griffiths were precisely the one forms or the n forms in higher dimensions. But for us, we don't really start with n forms. We, they are just something that has to be there in, in, in order to be able to define the norms. So uh, we come to the same situation almost, but from different uh, starting points. But anyway, the case of when L is equal is trivial, L equal to zero if you want, uh, that uh, is a theorem of Griffith. OK, so what does this mean then to, to, to compare it to Prekova? Well, if you uh, a metric on a vector bundle, uh, I call it H now. There are many H's here. It's not a holomorphic function anymore. This is a locally it's given by a matrix H. And the curvature of such a thing is a matrix value differential form, which you can write as the, like this. So this is positive definite matrix. You, you take the D of that. And you take H inverse, which exists, and you take D bar of the results. And then if you count like a, if you if you write like a beginner, you say that this is equal to minus D D bar of the this is the D D bar of the logarithm of H. Because here is 
dh inverse dh will be d of the logarithm of h. And then I have d bar and d in the wrong order, so I get a minus sign there. So this, intuitively, it's something like dd bar minus dd bar of the logarithm of h. And, uh, but of course, logarithm of h does not exist. This is just intuitive. So it says anyway that minus log h is plurisubharmonic, but minus log h, well, h uh, in, in the Prekopa case, it corresponds precisely to e to the minus phi tilde because it's uh, somehow the, the norm is the, in, it's the fiber integral of the u. So, uh, and, and before we had, in the Prekopa case, we had that uh, e to the minus phi tilde was equal to integral 1 e to the minus phi t x dx. And this depends on t only. So it's like formally similar that the, the norm, well, 1 squared, I should write here, doesn't matter so much, but just for philosophy, it should be 1 squared. So this is, uh, in the Prekopa case, you think of that as L2 norms. In the complex case, you look at the whole, L, uh, the whole norm, which is then a matrix, and uh, the conclusion then looks pretty similar to Prekopa. Uh, so uh, uh, from this, it does not follow that if you take any section of E, you can take the norm of that with respect to our metric. You can take the logarithm of the norm, you get something scalar here. This is not necessarily plurisubharmonic. So this is not the conclusion that you can draw. Yeah, unless the rank of E happens to be 1, which is a very particular case. But it, in order to get uh, the precise convexity statement, if you want, you should look at the dual instead. So uh, <clears throat> if you have, if psi sub t is a holomorphic section of the dual bundle, then uh, you, uh, the dual bundle inherits a metric from the bundle itself. And you can look at the log without the, the minus sign there. And then this is plurisubharmonic. So that's the, that's the more concrete statement that you get. Just knowing that such a gadget uh, is positive in some sense is not so useful. But the useful consequences are that all such objects, all such functions are plurisubharmonic. That's it. Okay, uh, and actually that's equivalent. If you know that all such functions are plurisubharmonic, as soon as you take a section of the dual bundle, you get something plurisubharmonic, then the, the, the curvature is positive. So that's uh, an equivalent statement of the theorem. Okay, so that was the most complicated uh, generalization because it's about manifolds and line bundles and such things, the more elementary version which is still a little bit more tricky, is the second version here. So I look at non-proper fibration. So now I just take, I can still use the same figure here. So now this is it's called beautiful D instead. And this here is uh, Cn, and this is Cm now. So like this. So I have a, a domain in uh, the product space, Cn plus m. And uh, I uh, look at the slices of, the, of those things. So this is, the, if I take a point t in here, I get the slice uh, dt, like that. Uh, and I get, for each t, I get a Bergman space. Now it's no, you don't need holomorphic forms. You can just look at the holomorphic functions of the slice. This is supposed to be straight. Holomorphic functions of the, on the slice that are square integrable against a plurisubharmonic function. So phi is plurisubharmonic in, in this domain here. And you look at those things. So we get something similar. For any t, you get a, a, a Hilbert space, which is now generally of infinite dimension. It's not finite dimension anymore. That's why this is, because if they are just bounded domains in, in C, and they can have infinite dimensions. 
but it doesn't matter. You, can st you still get a family of such Hilbert spaces, a bundle of Hilbert spaces. Uh, uh, let me wait with that. We get a bundle of Hilbert spaces, but it is not really in the technical sense a vector bundle because it's not locally trivial. Uh, so one has to be a little bit careful there. We have to say that if I take another slice here, there is no natural way, so this is dt prime, there is no natural way to identify the Hilbert space here with the Hilbert space there in general. So uh, it's just a bundle of Hilbert spaces, but it is not a Hilbert bundle. <laughs> it is, uh, but still, we can think of it as intuitively a, a vector bundle, but we'll, uh, we have to be a little bit generous with the definitions there. And now we take for any, yeah, for any compactly supported measure, so if we have a measure which is supported on here, mu is supported there on a compact subset of the fiber, we can, we can define its uh, norm in, uh, it's not the usual norm of a measure. It's uh, you take the supremum of the integral of h with respect to the measure over dt, where you take the supremum over all holomorphic functions in the Hilbert space of Hilbert norm less than one. Hilbert norm less than one. So you think of that. Uh, so mu defines an element in the dual space of et, uh, and uh, this is the norm in the dual space. Integrating with respect to a measure defines a, a, uh, an element in the dual space. Yeah. And then we have this conclusion. It's a little bit technical because I cannot just say that it has something just as positive curvature, but we formulate it like this instead. Uh, soon it's going to be a little bit uh, simpler. Uh, let's see. So we have all this situation. We have a pseudo-convex domain in Cn plus 1. We have all the slices. We have something plurisubharmonic in there, phi. And we have a family of measures. For any fiber, we have a measure. So here is another compact set and another measure here, that lies there. And we assume that those integrals, if I take a function h, which is holomorphic in uh, the big space, and I integrate it over the fiber with respect to this measure, I get a function of t. And I assume that this is always holomorphic if h is holomorphic. So that uh, takes a little bit of time to digest. But uh, intuitively, that means that mu t define holomorphic sections of the dual bundle. This is a condition that the map t to mu t is holomorphic. For any t, I get an element in the dual bundle, and, and it depends holomorphically on t in this sense. Then the conclusion is that the logarithm of those norms here is plurisubharmonic. So that uh, will take some time to get used to. Unfortunately, we will not really need to do that. But we look at, uh, yeah, that's just what I wrote, that it's a holomorphic section the dual bundle. Yes. Uh, le so let's look at a simple example of this theorem then, uh, where it is easier to digest. So uh, I first recall the definition of the Bergman kernel. So if H is a Bergman space of square integrable functions, the Bergman kernel is the integral kernel for the orthogonal projection. It, uh, so, uh, so there are square integrable functions on some domain with respect to some measure. You can look at, and they are holomorphic, but you can look at the space of all L2 functions. And the holomorphic ones will in general be a closed subspace and you have an orthogonal projection from all functions to the holomorphic ones. And that is given by an integral kernel and that kernel is the Bergman kernel. Yes, it's there. You, uh, the most important object is the restriction of the Bergman kernel to the di diagonal. And then you can define it uh, more uh, easily by saying that it is the supremum of the value of u at c squared divided by the norm over all u in the, that are holomorphic, that are in the Hilbert space. So if you want to, with my uh, definition before, 
write it here. You can say that uh, you can say that K C C. You can interpret this as the norm of a particular measure, namely the Dirac measure at the point C squared. That's the norm of this operating on holomorphic functions, the norm of the Dirac measure. The norm of the Dirac measure as a measure is one, but here it's, uh, it just operates on holomorphic functions. You compare it to the Hilbert norm of the holomorphic function, then it is the Bergman kernel. So that is what it means, what this means here. That's the Bergman kernel. So that plays a big role in complex analysis. OK, uh, now the, uh, the theorem is this. What is the theorem? It says that if you have this setting, you take the Bergman kernel. For each t, you have a, a Bergman kernel. And uh, the conclusion is that this function here, the logarithm of, uh, of the Bergman kernel, is plurisubharmonic as a function of both t and c, both t and c. It's very classical in the theory of Bergman kernels that it's plurisubharmonic with respect to C. It's very elementary, but important. But here's, uh, here, the theorem, the content of the theorem says that it, is, uh, uh, it has some subharmonicity property with, as a function of T also. That's the point of the theorem. And this follows from the theorem because this, uh, these Dirac measures here, they qualify as the measures mu in the theorem. So, in this simplest case here, you will get that the logarithm of the Bergman kernel is pluris-subharmonic. And this was proved before by Yamaguchi and Maitani, Maitani and Yamaguchi maybe, in the case of one complex variable and no weight function. So that's uh, their theorem in that case. Hmm. And as a consequence, we get this. Uh, yeah, we, uh, before I do that, I can just say that if we are in the real setting in Rn, we can look at the Bergman kernel in the same way for the space of constants. And if you think of it a little bit, you will find that the Bergman kernel is actually nothing but is a constant, and it's one over the volume of the set. So the Brun Minkowski theorem says that the real variable Bergman kernel is log concave, here, here uh, log convex. And here we have that the complex Bergman kernel is uh, pluris, log pluris harmonic. So th therefore, it looks very similar. And then a special case of this is when you have some sort of symmetry. So we assume that the sets and phi are symmetric under uh, one, one dimensional circle action. So you multiply all the variables by e to the i theta. The domain should not change, and the function should not change. And we also assume that zero lies in all the fibers. So we have a zero section in here. And then the conclusion is that the logarithm of those integrals is plurisubharmonic. Then it looks really a lot like Prekopa. Then it's just no holomorphic functions left anymore, but just the integrals of subharmonic. If you so, uh, the complete Prekopa does not work. But if you have this. Uh, uh, symmetry property, then it does work. Then you get it. And this is just because the, in that case, when you have all this, the Bergman kernel at the origin is precisely this. So, so it's just a, a particular case of the theorem about the Bergman kernel. And uh, one can go one step further, and we have the following theorem. So. Uh, <coughs> We have more symmetry, so we have a plurisubharmonic function in uh, the entire space. And if you assume it does not depend on the imaginary part of C, so it, uh, it's just a function of T and X, if X is the real part. And then we define this phi tilde like this, and then it, the conclusion is that this is plurisubharmonic in T. And this is really an honest generalization of Prekopa's theorem, and therefore Brun Minkowski then. Because uh, if phi is also in the, uh, also only depends on the real part of T, then uh, it's precisely the same thing as Prekopa's theorem. 
because a, a plural subharmonic function is convex if it uh, does not depend on the imaginary part. And from this follows, for instance, Schissemann's minimum principle, which has been used quite a lot in Maryland, I think, by Thomas and by Janir. Schissemann's minimum principle, it says that the infimum over all x of a function phi like this is plural subharmonic. So this is a bit strange. This is a useful theorem in many uh, settings, in many situations, as is well known here. But normally, infima of plurisubharmonic things are not plurisubharmonic. Infima of convex functions are not, in general, convex. The maxima of convex functions are, con are convex. So this, again, it goes in the opposite direction. But it still holds, then, that uh, this theorem still holds if you have this invariance property here, right? all, the, all the assumptions. But the infimum of this thing is uh, plurisubharmonic. So this is an important ingredient. I think it's fair to say in the work of Thomas and Janir on, a, on a geodesics in the space of Keller metrics, for instance. And why does it follow from uh, this thing here? Because all you need to do is that you, you, you need to multiply phi here by m, a very large number. And then you take m roots, which you can also do. And then you let m go to infinity. And then this integral here will be uh, precisely this thing here. It's, it's a consequence of the fact that LP norms tend to L infinity norms when P goes to infinity. So Schissemann's minimum principle follows on this. Hmm. OK, so, and then as the very last thing, I just uh, give another statement, which is due to Dario Cordero, Erascan, uh, which is uh, more maybe of an honest uh, application, which says that, uh, so this is from analysis. It says that you have two, you have CN. You have CN, and that's a, uh, that's a Banach space, if you want to. You can give it different norms. You can give it one norm, zero norm, and another norm, of one norm. They are Banach norms now, so they are just uh, one homogeneous uh, thing. And then you can use the ries turin theorem, Swedish theorem, and find intermediate norms here by the method of complex interpolation. And uh, you can look at the, vo uh, at the unit balls with respect to those norms. They are the BT. And you can look at their volumes, and then this is a concave function of this. So I don't think that was known before. So this uses, again, the, this business about, well, one of the theorems I had before, uh, that consequence, because you can view this as some sort of a Bergman kernel, uh, this, uh, the volume of Bt there. And uh, OK, so that was what I had planned to say for today. And then the, uh, next time I will give some applications to complex analysis and complex geometry. Yeah. Yes.